Hi, um, welcome to the session on why robotics, um, why now is the right opportunity to use robotics in care. Um, my name is Leslie Grant and I work for PA Consulting Group, which is a, a technology consulting firm. Um, and I specialise in delivering complex change programmes in um, health and care sector. Um, and we're here to talk today about um, some of the opportunities we think there are, in, in particularly in social care, for using more technology and robotics. Um, I've worked on a couple of projects related to it most recently, and we'll tell you about them today. Um, I did the first ever trial of collaborative robots in care delivery in Hampshire, which we'll hear a bit about. I also lead PA's Robotics in Care Community of Interest, um, which we've got members of um, here today, which you can hear from. Um, the Robotics in Care Community of Interest is, um, and I'll introduce you to some of those members, is basically something that we set up a few years ago because we were, um, we realised that there was a real lack of understanding of the opportunities that robotics could present in, 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 in care. Um, and the aim was simple. We just wanted to develop a common voice for adult social care leaders in this area um, and develop that understanding. It's comprised of leaders from across um, the UK in adult social care, um, from Hampshire, Dorset, Kingston, um, York and Birmingham, and we're always looking to grow. And we meet with lots of different stakeholders to continuously learn about robotics from large um, like Amazon Web Services to small niche developers. We work with academics. We've visited um, Imperial and Bristol Robotics Labs to policymakers and regulators. We're keen to constantly learn and develop in this area for our members. We've written a report, which we all share with uh, you, which is just about some of our findings on the key challenges um, in the social care sector and how we think robotics um, could address those. We produce a quarterly bulletin on developments across the robotic sector, so not just about social care, to just again promote and develop understanding for our members. Um, and we've also just recently done a survey, which we're going to hear a bit about more today um, from our members, which is just to find out what their real um, challenges are right now, and where they think um, there are opportunities to use more robotics and AI and um, to really support the vulnerable people that they that they work with. So I'm going to hand over to um, some of our members and introduce them um, right now. Hello, everyone. I'm Graham Allen. I'm the Director of Adults Health and Care at Hampshire County Council. Um, I think as, as, as part of uh, a few words of introduction, just to say in terms of, of my interests around uh, use of technology and indeed uh, AI and robotics, it's, it's been a probably um, a 15 plus year journey of interest for me. So. I was uh, lucky, lucky enough to work in a local authority that was um, one of three local authorities as part of the whole system uh, demonstrator uh, program many, many years ago. Um, and, and that really kind of prompted interest. I approached the use of technology absolutely as a Luddite, uh, but on the basis of what's the problem we're seeking to solve and uh, certainly engagement over those 15 uh, plus years. Uh, particularly with, with people using uh, technologies of all kinds, have absolutely uh, inspired and driven me. And I stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before me uh, in Hampshire in terms of the relationships that we have and our use of care technologies. So really delighted to be part of this panel today. I'm Sharon Holden. I'm the Director of Adult Social Care and Health at Royal Borough of kingston upon Thames. Um, like Graham, I've got uh, a very strong interest in particularly the practical, what I call the practical application of robotics to direct caregiving, which sounds a bit of a mouthful, but basically that's prompted by my own um, experience and from talking to others about what it feels like to be dependent, even intermittently or even for a short period of time um, and what you actually need when you need help to do something what actually is going to really help and support you um, in my time I've come across a lot of myths about technology that I want to bust 
and, and joining the robotics and care community of interest when the opportunity was put to me and getting a chance to talk to colleagues like Graham and others who are like-minded. Um, I leapt at the chance because that wasn't available in our community or in the business we do or across um, the regions as DAS is. That wasn't available previously. So um, for me, it's about taking any opportunity that you can to talk about what will really matter and make a difference. This is one of many of those opportunities. Um, but as I say, I'm really particularly interested in us doing something tangible and seeing how it works and brings good results. I'm Steve Careful. I'm a director with PA Consulting. I've been with the firm for uh, about 16 years now in our public services practice. And for most of that, I've been working with adult social care and probably the last 10 or 11 years, focusing increasingly sharply on care technology and, and how you mainstream care technology. And we've, we've had two very good steers already from, uh, uh, from colleagues on the panel about what drives mainstreaming it's the ability to deliver an outcome um, it's not the technology however the technology is an enabler so we need to really understand what it can do so we can match up the need with um, uh, with what's available hello i'm praminda caleb solly i'm professor of assistive robotics and intelligent healthcare technologies at the bristol robotics lab in the university of the west of england my background is in electronic systems engineering biomedical instrumentation engineering, and I have a PhD in interactive evolutionary computation. From 2014 to 2018, I was the head of electronics and computer systems at Designability, an assistive technology SME and charity in Bath. I lead on a range of multidisciplinary projects, investigating safety and regulatory requirements for assistive robots, and work with health and social care providers and service users to co-design and evaluate smart technology solutions to support independent living and well-being. Um, I've been involved in the uh, robotics in care group uh, since it started, and and I've, uh, it's one of the one of the really enjoyable sessions each quarter to get together with with colleagues from around the place and and, and just talk about what our experiences are, what we've come across in the meantime, how people are getting on with uh, with uh, with experiments and pilots, and and also what developers and academics and uh, some of the big organisations like Amazon that Leslie's mentioned are doing in this space that we could apply. Um, to problems um, and challenges that we've got. And it, and it was that um, desire to ensure that the sessions that we have remain vital and relevant that led us to um, a, a month or two ago to, to run a survey uh, through the members of the group, but more widely uh, than, than the people who turn up to the actual sessions to get views on uh, what, uh, what the challenges are short term, what are the urgent things, uh, what are the things that are maybe longer term uh, challenges that need to be we need to be preparing to address and where do they see robotics in care and what are the attitudes towards robotics and AI in relation to those challenges so I'm going to just give you a quick insight into the um, the results of that survey could we just pop up the first slide please um, now this um, there is a there is a um, a version of this that's available, I think it's in the chat, there's a link you can download so uh, you don't need to, uh, to jot anything down. Uh, the, the survey basically was, uh, was sent out um, th through the members of the group to their senior management colleagues um, and the next slide please will we'll, we'll show the, uh, the main results of that. So um, we split it into, uh, in, into on, the, on the slide, which is just a summary of the results, we split it into three categories. On the left-hand side, that column is urgent challenges. So what are the things that are really keeping you awake right now, the things that you uh, are grappling with from a social care point of view? Uh, to the right, the middle column, opportunities for robotics. Where would you see robotics and AI potentially playing a part um, in addressing challenges? And thirdly, uh, on the right there, longer term challenges. So what are the things that are maybe not necessarily a burning platform today, but you know they're gonna be a problem that you'll have to solve at some point in the future. And you can see that the first uh, long arrow at the top there, the thing that came at the, that hit all those buttons was, was care workforce capacity. And, and uh, Leslie and, uh, has already mentioned that the, the work we've been doing on cobots 
uh, with Hampshire, uh, the urgent challenge of matching supply and demand when you've got more people in need of, of care support and fewer people available or willing to get into the care workforce. That was seen as a, an urgent challenge by, by many of the respondents. Um, and a clear opportunity to use robotics. There's just a kind of obvious link there. It's just a matter of finding the right way to do it. Um, but also that that's a longer term challenge, that workforce. That's not going away. That is something that's going to be with us and potentially getting, uh, getting more acute as the demographic pressures that are coming through society now continue and as um, uh, the, uh, the opportunity for people to do other things other than working care uh, uh, continue to be available, people will, uh, will, we will be short of people in the longer term. The middle uh, grey bar there was um, uh, both an urgent challenge and an opportunity for robotics, preventing the need for care in the first place. A very, very common theme talking to uh, local authority social care directors around the country. How do we shift uh, the onus away from publicly provided care at the point of crisis to keeping people living independently for as long as possible? And again, a kind of obvious area to think uh, there must be opportunities for robotics there. And that's certainly what the survey respondents flagged up. A long-term challenge uh, to the right of that care home state sustainability came out uh, frequently as, as an area uh, of challenge as well and, and maybe one we can pick up in the in the Q&A shortly. Third urgent channel, the most common challenge uh, flagged up was delivering mental health services and Whilst people didn't necessarily see the link to opportunities for robotics there, I think from an AI, AI point of view, there definitely are opportunities there. And again, something we may explore um, in the Q&A. Um, other robotics opportunities addressing social isolation with, with social robots, robots that need not be a device that moves around and picks things up. It can be an interactive, it, in effect, the, the Amazon Echo, the uh, Google Home are, are a type of uh, a robotic or AI intervention that can help to alleviate social isolation. And we've seen that in the way we've deployed those types of devices in Hampshire to give people the ability to have a book read to them or listen to music or, 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 or control their environment in a way that they perhaps weren't able to do uh, independently any longer. And then delivering services to people with dementia is a long-term challenge. There's a growing concern about the number of people with, uh, with cognitive impairment and how we can uh, uh, position ourselves to, to, uh, to respond to that. We then asked some questions um, about uh, perceptions uh, uh, about robotics. And I, I, I was slightly surprised in a sense, although obviously we're talking to a group of authorities that, are, that have already started to make steps in this direction and become involved and expressed interest in this kind of thing. But actually the majority of the respondents felt their organisations were not negatively predisposed. There's a bit of a double negative there, but basically it says the door is available to be pushed open on robotics. You're not going to get necessarily uh, in the view of the respondents from organisations like councils a, 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 a sort of visceral we can't be doing this response to robotics. There is a recognition that there's a role there, which I think is really, really interesting and important and a, and a, and a message to take away and test perhaps in your own authorities. And then about three out of five of the respondents said that the, the thing that was impeding their progress in this area was just an understanding of what the robotics market consisted of and what's available. And, and frankly, that's understandable because it changes daily uh, and there are developments going on within academic institutions, within, develop, within uh, manufacturing, Manufacturers and developers, often in uh, sectors that we don't necessarily relate to daily. Uh, defense is a big driver of robotic technology, uh, industry manufacturing, there's been robots in there for a long time, but it's the read across I think that we need to be uh, looking for. So, as we heard there, um, one of the biggest challenges was in um, care workforce capacity, um, and one of the res our responses to that in, in social care was. Um, we ran a trial of collaborative robots. We're going to hear a little bit more about this now um, from Graham Allen at Hampshire County Council, who we worked with to trial collaborative robots or active kind of exoskeletons worn around the lower back to support care workers and deliver care. And then we'll get show you a video because it's quite hard to see to understand what it's like of, of, of how we did that. Well, in Hampshire, some three, almost four years ago now, uh, we were looking at the prospect that um, by 2023, 25, um, over that kind of five year uh, forward time frame, in terms of our demographic, we would need to grow the social care workforce uh, by around about another 7,000 uh, recruits, another 7,000 staff. That, you know, patently was going to be extremely challenging, to, to put it mildly. 
were there some things that we could do to make better use of uh, the, the highly skilled workforce that we've already got and the social care workforce in Hampshire is already fairly big. It's 35,000 uh, people through CQC uh, regulated uh, businesses. Um, what we did was we, we started thinking about how might we solve some of that care workforce challenge. That was, that was the, the, the problem. We defined it part and parcel, we believe, of, of the answer going forward is, is the use of collaborative robots, cobots, which means that actually uh, we should be able to limit and, and have far better and more efficient use of the workforce that we've got, reducing double up care. Actually, the outcomes for individuals are far better on the basis that the carer is present. They're talking to the, the person they are supporting rather than uh, uh, double uh, handed care where frequently uh, generalization but frequently the carers may be having a conversation with one another rather than with the person they're caring for sweeping generalization I know but cobots is is one of the things able to really see a difference like working with service users wearing the cobot and not wearing the cobot so when we were doing heavy moving and handling positions the support I got from that was absolutely amazing. The task that I find it more helpful um, wearing it is definitely repositioning residents, um, rolling, uh, mo yeah, moving position in the bed. With residents that may need a little bit more support I feel like I can roll them and support for a lot longer. It makes me think about what I'm doing. So if I wasn't wearing this, I would probably outbend or, or twist in a way that I shouldn't. The service users have been very, very interested in this piece of equipment. We thought they might be a little bit you know, apprehensive, a bit nervous, a bit scared, but they've been really interested. They've been asking questions. It's been very positive. When the residents see this, they're like, oh, it's clever, it's a brilliant idea. Having a piece of equipment that would look after a care worker, support them in their daily life to prolong their journey in care is a win-win. Um, one of my colleagues actually wore their cobalt all day. After her shift, she actually said, I'm ready to do a whole other shift. It does feel like an exoskeleton. It just feels part of my body. But I sleep better because I'm not aching. The, the whole day hasn't been like weighing down on my shoulders or my back, and it feels good. So hopefully, um, that video of the cobots gave you an interesting um, introduction into one of the examples of what we've used. And um, but really, what keen to ask now is what's stopping us from using robots and AI more widely in care? Well, so I think really simplistically what's stopping us is everything and nothing. Um, so starting with nothing, there, there actually is when you dissect, and I really believe this, and I can be challenged on this and I would like to be because I think it, it, it's a really interesting debate. I honestly do not know of any real reason why we can't grab a hold of this and make it happen. Um, and I've thought about this and, to, and discussed it with colleagues and have never been able to come up with a real barrier that is insurmountable. So, so that's the nothing bit. The everything bit for me is about the way that we have, that we traditionally um, and I'm going to say largely as local authorities, because I think that that's the context in which we are coming together in a discussion like this, the way that we traditionally think about the way to do business. So, you know, that that um, bit of a blanket statement here, but but that historical perhaps lack of flexibility, that risk aversion and um, that, you know, to some extent belief that we actually know what's best for people and. Um, all of that is is the the everything that gets in the way. So for me, it's um, a really you know seismic shift in the way we approach how we do business and what our role is and, and what our purpose is. And um, technologies and new technologies 
and applying them in ways that we haven't previously thought of actually gives us an opportunity to to shift to practice shifting our business models in one thing that will that will support a range of other ways in which we could shift our thinking that for me um, it's graham here I, I i just following up on that and again uh, of course absolutely agree with you and this is probably one of those panels where everyone will end up agreeing with everyone i think there is something which is um, I, th- I think for us as as leaders in, in social care, actually the, the the barrier or the challenge is an internal one in terms of how do we overcome some of the scepticism we, we might have or some of the cynicism. How do we move out of the tram lines of um, moving away from delivering our, our support to our residents in, in what is a very traditional way? And, and actually embracing all kinds of, of new risks, which at times might be scary, but my comment would be, actually, it's not. It releases a huge amount of latent capacity across the sector, across our, our, our uh, workforce, and actually provides far greater opportunity in terms of delivering uh, outcomes to our residents. Sharon's right. It's... Uh... It's a, the lack sometimes of a, of, of, a, of a sufficiently hot burning platform. And if we think back to what's happened in COVID and look at something like the ventilator challenge, which PA was involved in supporting that. And one of the really memorable things that I've, uh, uh, I've picked up from that exercise was one of the ventilator manufacturers involved in that who would normally have taken to produce a ventilator machine 10 months of very slow, deliberate testing, regulatory review. They were producing um, uh, uh, ventilators in in days um, as opposed to months. And that was because we just had to. And and there's a degree to which I think some of the challenges, and the reason why we were asking on the survey about urgent as well as long-term challenges is what are the things that are driving your problems now, your challenges now, because they're the things that should be encouraging you to make a start. And linked to that, and, and, and possibly just to pick up Graham's point about uh, everybody agreeing with each other and to be slightly controversial I, I think one of the one of the challenges in the in the sector is that we try and get consensus all the time for everything we don't really want to start anything that's slightly new or challenging without getting everybody on board and agreed I don't think you've got the the luxury of that really I, I think there are certain circumstances where you just say well look as Graham's just described with the Cobots project doesn't matter how many times we get together in a workshop and talk about it we're still going to be 7,000 people short in the workforce we're going to do something about that now we might not commit fully to something without a, without a test um, and we'll obviously make sure that we get the right people involved in getting it right but we're not going to seek permission from every single stakeholder because they won't all agree with it to start with sometimes you've just got to go out there and have a go and say this is what we meant and Leslie will tell you actually when we first started talking about cobots and people look very quizzical and scratch their heads and thought well, that doesn't sound right and expected terminator to be to show up when you actually show them the device or put it on them they they, they just there's a you know they immediately think oh yeah that makes perfect sense i like that can i have one and and you you we wouldn't have known that if we'd spent two years in workshops asking people what they thought of the idea there are a number of challenges stopping us from realizing the opportunities for using robots in care But before I go on and talk about some of these challenges, I would like to take a step back and emphasize something. You can't just take a disruptive technology such as a robot and start using it. You have to follow a carefully planned and managed technology adoption pathway. The bench to bedside journey is complex and first and foremost starts with a recognition of need before the assumption that a robotics technology-based solution will be able to meet this need or unmet need. You have to consider how this technology will change the existing care pathways, how the roles of those involved will change. In addition, you have to consider whether this technology has the appropriate regulatory approval. Regulatory compliance and assuring safety are two of the biggest challenges. Then this robotics technology requires validation through clinical studies in the specific healthcare setting that it's going to be deployed in. This might require adaptation of the technology to the local context. Clinical studies require a lot of time and money, including navigating a plethora of ethics and research protocols. In terms of the technology becoming available, these issues have to be addressed together with ensuring that the health workforce will have the skills 
to work alongside these technologies. Robots are intelligent systems that adapt to their environment through processing data from a range of sensors. But before they can be deployed, they have to be trained or set up to self-train, verified, and then there is ongoing maintenance. The other challenge is finding the resources available to enable various care providers to work together with us engineers to design, develop and integrate the robotics technologies and trial them as part of their service delivery. If we continue to just develop robots in our labs without actually seeing commitment of care staff time to co-produce solutions, we will not only end up with solutions that are not able to achieve the intended purpose, uh, but we will never come to seeing these technologies adopted. So how can we make a start? I think we've already made a start. You know, okay. so, so, and some of the things that we're talking about here um, I think it's it's not so much about making the start. It's more about, um, for me, it's about now talking to a wider audience. And one and this workshop is an example of that, beginning to talk to the wider audience about, A, the start we've already made and the stuff that we've already been doing to really good effect, for example, the work that Graham's been leading, and B, um, the things that we are thinking and planning um, that are actually in the thinking and planning stage at the moment. So, for example, in Kingston, um, one of the projects that we are getting off the ground um, and we are about to uh, award a contract to a change partner to support us to do this in, in technology specifically is to develop um, a robotic intervention or solution that will, I guess, in plain speaking, wash and dress people um, as opposed to having um, a person do that and perform, you know, intimate personal care and food preparation and some of the stuff that we that is very intensively provided by um, traditional home care packages. Now that in itself is um, it, that, that is a brave and bold and ambitious step that, that we are going to deliver on and we're very excited about it. Um, but it generates a whole range of debates and discussions um, along the whole spectrum from people who, who are outraged at that prospect to people who are thrilled at the idea that something like this will enhance their dignity in a whole range of ways that having care delivered by an individual won't. So I, there's a now i think as a sector as a business as a as an industry and we are actually an industry and um, we need to be sharing that and we need to be having those debates very publicly and using all opportunities to do that really i'm, I'm really um grateful for the opportunity to bring the work we've been doing in the community of interest into this forum and and start that debate in a, in a wider way i think one of the things um for me is that um it's, it's again returning to, to some of those those kind of problem definitions and, and working our, our ways through and creating circumstances and opportunities. And this is where I'm going to be probably a little bit contradictory that actually you need to do uh, more than one thing at the same time. So you need to be having those conversations within your organisation. You need to be having those conversations uh, with, with partners, care uh, providers and others. You also need, I think, uh, to create political circumstances within uh, local authorities in terms of, of benefits and use. Get things moving. Don't wait uh, for, for permission to be given. Um, be, be less risk averse. Uh, feel the fear and, and, and do it anyway. Um, I think there's then also something about how within um, our workforce uh, we create change champions or, or people able to offer support uh, to their colleagues. One of the, the lines there within the, the, the Q&A uh, is, is around um, innovation funding per team. Uh, I, I, there may be some merit in that. My own personal view is do it at scale. Um, we'll, we'll, we've had many, many debates around, you know, piloting versus doing. Uh, I personally don't like pilots. I prefer the, the idea of doing, get on um, and, and jump in and providing you've, you've got the, the, the kind of problem definition sorted, 
you can then draw in any number of, of experts. As I said earlier, I'm a Luddite. I have, I have no particular insight in terms of the, the technologies that are being deployed. But um, if, if I've got anything, I think it's probably um, some, some experience in being able to define and unpack a problem. And then much, much wiser people than me are able to, to uh, roll in with, with potential options uh, that, that might be brought forward, but no solution. Uh, will we'll offer a panacea to any of the individual and myriad problems that we face. It's got to be on, on the, the level of individual uh, service users and stuff that can be scaled up. A term I like to use is mass customization. Yeah, that enables you to tailor the response based on the need, whilst at the same time deploying a whole variety of similar solution at scale. A good place to start is introducing an existing reliable platform, such as a telepresence robot, and evaluating it as part of a service improvement pilot. So I will give you an example of the North Bristol Trust Hospital at Southmead. They have been pioneers in the use of robots in their hospitals, using them for delivery of laundry and meals. And now, um, from earlier this year, they have been running a pilot study with their hospital at home team to explore how the current knee replacement pathway can be made simpler and more efficient. For their evaluation, they identified the key areas that they wanted to track benefits to both patients and staff. The first area was patient-centered care, considering how can the telepresence robots improve accessibility for patients or staff, overcome obstacles with transport and distance with the ability to have multiple healthcare consultations in one remote visit. Then improving efficiency and timeliness of care by providing independent remote working within a physical environment, which helps specialists fit in more in their day, reducing the need for travel between the patient's home and increasing the number of appointments that can be provided per hour of staff time. And of course, enhancing patient safety. With the use of telepresence robots, infection control is improved as there is less direct physical contact with patients. So introducing a robot such as a telepresence robot where the patients can still see and talk to a healthcare professional can help to improve and build trust and confidence in the technology and also increase user acceptance of these technologies. Last year, I launched a startup which has now been incorporated as a community interest company called Robotics for Good, and we provide telepresence robots and expertise in enabling care providers understand how best to deploy and use this technology most effectively. We also provide personalized training packages and implementation support to suit a care organizations specific needs. So if anyone is interested in taking one of these telepresence robots on a test drive, please do get in touch with me or visit our website roboticsforgood.co.uk. And who are some of the other organizations that we need to work with or, or collaborate with in this space? Um, my answer to that is talk to anybody in your local network that you think A, will listen to you and B, may have a take on this and can add something to the conversation. And I, I'm you know, a great believer in no conversation is ever a wasted conversation. There, there will always be something that comes for it. So everybody, everyone on this call will have a different set of networks um, that's very particular to their own um, area. And they will, they will, you will know instinctively who you, who you can talk to and who you can sort of socialize these ideas and these concepts with. So work with anyone who listens to you and work with anyone who wants to take part in, in this debate, whether they be local businesses, whether they be education providers, whether they be local care providers, colleagues, um, talk to me. 
And I'm really wanting, alongside the community of interest, to do, to do some work alongside other local authority colleagues with them. I mean, Graham and I already work quite closely with this, but we'd like to grow that group and um, very much like to share some of our practices and learn from others. Um, so, so for me, there is no barrier to who we should and, and shouldn't be speaking to. Um, speak to academics, speak to people who know what they're doing and talking about, um, yeah. Uh, join our community of interest. <laughs> One group that I think we, we need to be better at engaging with is, is government and the, and the, those that hold the purse strings because the burden is falling at the moment on the likes of Graham and Sharon to, to solve problems that are not Hampshire and Kingston problems. These are England and UK, in fact, arguably global problems. That's not right. You, you've got... <laughs> You know, you've got limitations on the resources available and some of these enterprises are expensive and risky. Uh, you know, we need government money involved to support the development of solutions that will a solve the social care problems we're facing, but also boost uh, UK PLC. We should be net exporters of this kind of technology. And uh, Graham won't mind me saying, you know, for the Cobot pilot that with the Pathfinder that we ran, we had to make special arrangements to, to import half a dozen Cobots to get that going from Japan. Um, there wasn't anybody making them in the UK. There still isn't anybody making them in the UK. Uh, and, and that will be a massive missed opportunity if we can't get the, get the attention of people who, who, who make those kinds of national investment decisions. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd certainly, uh, of course, colleagues be really keen for, for investment from, from government and elsewhere. But I think there's actually a, another condition which would be really helpful, which is the underwriting of the risk rather than the upfront cash to do some of this stuff. We've, we've had to trailblaze. We've had to, you know, working with the likes of the health and safety executive, the college uh, of OT, uh, trade and industry, as Steve has said, in terms of import licenses, we've, we've had to do a huge amount of work within the COBOT project. We don't begrudge doing that work, but we've had to do it uh, ourselves. Some underwriting by government, by government departments uh, would be welcome alongside their cash. It's not just cash um, to some degree. Uh, you know, innovation will come from those of us that continue to strive with the little resource that we've got and making it go further. I don't necessarily subscribe to throw more money at a problem and you'll get a better outcome and result. It's innovation here, which is key. It's brain power and then making things uh, happen as we go. We need a national effort. We need to bring together engineers, researchers, businesses, health and social care professionals, as well as end users to affect the wider use of healthcare robots. From September this year, I will be leading a team of four other universities, Sheffield, Harriet Watts, Sheffield Hallam and Hertfordshire. And together, we will be working to establish a new national network called Emergence, funded by EPSRC under their Healthcare Technologies Network Plus program. The network goal will be to galvanize patient-focused healthcare robotics research and knowledge exchange, ensuring increased uptake by facilitating health and social care, industrial and academic experts to come together in solving real-world challenges to supporting people with frailty. And this knowledge will also be extended to other patient groups. We recognized an urgent need to join forces and work systematically to provide a clear agenda and roadmap for healthcare robotics research in the UK. The network will nurture and support a community of researchers in healthcare and robotics through pilot feasibility studies, sponsored and facilitated by the network to develop new approaches beyond the state of the art. 300,000 will be made available for these pilot projects so if you are interested in participating, watch this space. Our vision for Emergence is to unite a fragmented research community, build up a body of knowledge and set up a sustainable framework for bringing healthcare robotics out of the lab and into the real world. Thank you, um, Graham and Sharon and Steve and Praminda. Some really, really interesting insights into um, some of the challenges but also the opportunities um, and the, some I hope we can hear some of the passion there um, for, for, for why we should be using robotics in care and um, we've got I know um, we've got a collaboration session immediately following this so hopefully you can join us in that and I 
believe we're also sharing um, a, a report that our Robotics and Care Community of Interest wrote, which is called um, A Moment of Opportunity. So please do um, access that. And also, I think we're sending a, there's an email address to our Robotics and Care Community of Interest if you're interested in either becoming a member or presenting to our members or just have a question, please do get in touch. Look forward to seeing you at our collaboration session next. Thank you.